This is Code Red Rules coming to you. I'm going to record a 100NL lecture style video today. It will be titled loosely How to Get Value from Your Made Hands. To some of you guys, these aren't going to be anything new. Hopefully, to everybody else, it, it's going to be an interesting and fun lecture. It's going to take me it's going to be me hitting a lot of made hands on the flop and see how I get stacks by the end of the hand. So, it's it's definitely not about bad beats, but it's just more about getting value and hopefully having some fun. So, I'm going to go ahead and get this going here. And as you can see, we have pocket sevens in the big blind. And I'm going to tell you right now that there are two effective players in this hand, and it's going to be Weezer without the second E in the middle, and Dzinan, I can't pronounce it. The reads I have on these players, I have no reads on Dzinan at this time. He has one hand history in my database and no stats, but I can give an estimation that with his random with his random stack size here of $43.10. That's probably his entire balance, and he's probably not a very good player. Because usually the really good players are either going to top off at some number, whole number 50 or 100, but something about $43.10 does not make me think he's a very good player. Wezer, on the other hand, I do have some hands on. I have a very small sample of roughly 20 hands or so, and in that time period he's a 36-16. Post-flop stats are non-existent with these small samples. So let's go ahead and get this hand started. Under the gun limper, we don't give him much credit in this scenario, but we can. And Wezer in this scenario is going to isolate him. And we're not going to go ahead and squeeze or anything. We're just going to go ahead and cold call for set value. There is it's four dollars for us to call. The pot is twelve and a half. We're already getting three three point one to one. We need roughly eight point seven to one total pot odds, including implied odds, to make this call. And so roughly, we're going to have to hit four dollars times. 8.7, we're looking at $36 net. And if we do a flop a set, it's going to be a, a good chance that we can get some of that value, given the fact that it's only, oh, what is it, like 2.5%, no, I'm sorry, 4% of our stacks or so for to call. So it's looking like it's going to, uh, if we do hit, there's a good chance that we can get some value, especially with this other player in the pot tier too. Uh, meanwhile, the under the gun limper does not go ahead and come in, so that's why it's three handed to us. And since this value this video is about me getting value from hands, naturally I flop a set. Now, some players could lead here, and then there are there are several scenarios that we could do. We could check with the intention of raising weather. We could check on the intention of calling, depending on what happens. We could bet. We're not, obviously never folding, but we can bet and hope Wezer raises us and then we can shove all in or bet and then call is raised you know, along those lines somewhere now since we've already stated this guy here is probably a very weak player given his thirty his weak stack size the fact that he cold called a raise for a large percent of his stack well, it cost him five dollars to call and forty out of forty three so he's not calling for set value. So he really, he's not he, he's not impressing with him with his play. So we can assume that he's a very bad player also. And in those regards, is I want the bad player to put money in the pot also. And with that, I don't want to lead into our opponent. Because if he does have aces or kings and he's going to stack off, he's going to raise us and he's going to raise the donkey out of the pot. And we do not want to raise the donkey out of a pot when we have such a strong hold on the hand. And the reason why I say we have such a stronghold in the hand because look at this board. Our, we're putting on our opponent, hopefully our opponent has an overpair. Very strong overpair on this scenario. We are only 
behind in the scenario to pocket eights. And if he has pocket eights, then it's cooler, we'll rebuy and not worry about it, set over set. But in those regards, we're we're hoping that he has a hand like aces, kings, maybe even threes, so we can get his stack. Meanwhile, we want our donkey opponent in here to put in as much chips as he possibly can, practically drawing dead. Unless he has a hand 9, 10, 6, 8, or 5, 6 in this scenario, or maybe even 4 or 5, one of those rare connecting drawing hands, then he's he's practically drawing dead with the other hand that he has, and we want him to stay in the pot. So leading, I'm not a big fan of here. So I go ahead and check, and I, I pretty much have the scenario down, because our opponent here, we are in the best possible position according to the Razor. We, we, last at, we act last to the pre-flopped Razor, and so that means our opponent is going to lead here, 13 and 17, and this is another good sign that our opponent has a strong hand. If he were to check here, it's a, it's not a very good sign at all that he has a good hand. He might have ace-king and just give up on the flop. So since he, lit, since he led here, we're going to assume that he has a decent strong hand he's trying to protect. And now, depending on what our opponent here will do, we can decide if we want to raise or just flat and slow play our hand a little bit. In a common scenario, if, if, if it was heads up, I would much prefer to raise. We are trying to build a pot and so we can get all our money in on a later street. If we just flat here, we open ourselves up to get check, check behind on the turn, even our, if our opponent has a marginal decent hand, and we lose value. In this case scenario, the donkey here calls for a third of his stack, and who knows what he has. But fact of the matter is, I don't want him to fold. If he has a straight draw, then he has a straight draw. I'm not putting on I'm not putting Wezer on a straight draw or anything. In fact, I'm putting him on an overpair, like we've already stated. So as you can see, I still have a very, very strong lock in my hand. The pot is already $42. So I really don't need to raise here to build the pot to be able to get my stack in the middle. Because there's only $82 behind, and if I call 13, the pot will be 55 and we only have $82 behind, and we still have a full two streets of play left to go. Now, if the Zanin was not in the pot, there's only $30 in the pot, and with our thirteen dollars to call, you're looking at roughly forty-two dollars in the pot with eighty-two dollars effective behind. The reason why that is important is because he now has two to one. I'm uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to explain this. He now has two to one stack to pot ratio. As are the terms I'm going to use, and it's going to be much much harder for me to get the rest of those eighty-two dollars in on the turn if and we wanted to get to the turn, we don't want to get to the river, if there's only $42 in the pot. Because the fact of the matter is, if he leads here and we call, there's $42 in the pot, what are our options on the turn? We can check, and you know, hopefully he doesn't check behind, if it's only heads up. We were hoping that he value bets, but he's only going to value bet 26 27 or so into the $42 pot. So into this $42 pot, he's only going to, maybe he might lead 28 However, when as soon as we check raise the turn, we automatically give away our hand, and he st and he only was able to put in, oh, he was he didn't he, he wasn't even able to put in half of his stack when we flopped our set. Granted, we had enough odds, you know, even with our uh, pot odds preflop, but we 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 want his entire stack. That's that's what we're going for here. But since our opponent decides to overcall and he builds the pot with us, we can. We can take uh, a turn off, or I'm sorry, we can take another card, and hopefully, if if Wezer doesn't have a hand, maybe if he has Ace King and he has Air, he's trying to take the pot down, and maybe he'll turn an Ace, and then we'll get more value out of him that way. However, if he does have Air here, we don't want him to fold whatever hand he has, regardless. And if we check raise this board, we give away our hand pretty well too, and we're we're probably going to go ahead and get. This guy's 25 big blinds in there because he's a donkey and he's going to call us anyway. But we want this other guy's $82 as well. So we're not going to raise in this scenario. 
A lot of times I'm going to raise if it's heads up, because I want to build the pot. However, this pot has already been building, so I'm not going to raise. If it was a little bit draw heavier board, if it was two hearts out here, or if it was maybe two Broadway cards. Two Broadway cards is because uh, the two Broadway cards hits a lot of his hands, his possible hands, and so he's going to be more likely to stack off with me if he has a top two pair kind of hand, and if I have a set. And the flush draw, because if I check raise, he might think that I'm on a flush draw, and therefore pay me off as well. So I flat, and the jack, not that bad of a card. Uh, obviously, I'm now behind 9-10, but I'm not really worried about anybody not having 9-10 in this scenario, and I have it locked up. And Especially Weather doesn't have 9-10, most likely. Most likely, if anybody does have it, it's Zanon. He's only 25 big blinds deep, and we're, we're stacking off his hand regardless. But now that the flush draw is out here coming out, we kind of want to not give any more free cards. However, I have a f this is just one of those scenarios where if Wesler does have a hand like aces or kings or queens, he's going to go ahead and lead again, and probably just enough to get this person all in. If he leads twenty dollars and this slide this guy raises at twenty five. I'm not actually able to, to go all in because he's protected his hand, and that would be a problem. But I'm assuming Wesler is going to go ahead and lead, if he has an over pair here, lead a pretty big size, at least 26. And you're going to see how that is going to go hurt against him, because I think that's exactly what he leads. 29, just enough to get this player all in. Look at the pot though right now. The pot is already 84.50 because of Dezanin. And we're going to go ahead and keep going here and see on the turn. The Zanin goes ahead and goes, goes all in, so we're kind of worried that he might have 910, but look how much is in the pot right now. It's $110 in the pot. The pot is so bloated that we really don't care if Wizzer right now goes all in with us with, with a hand like Aces or Kings because we've already gotten massive value from our hand. We've already gotten this player's 45 big blinds plus this player's 45 big blinds. So we've already got roughly 90 big blinds, and we've only put in 17 something like that. What are we at? Yeah, 92 big blinds. We've only put in 17. So that is, it's already a monster pot, and we don't want another turn, scare card to come off on the river, say a, 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 another heart, where our opponent is not going to give us as much value. So we got to stop slow playing, and we're just going to go ahead and shove. And the reason why the shove works so well in this scenario, our opponent has 82 behind, just like us. Look how big the pot is now. The pot is now $191.00. And it's fifty-three dollars for him to call, which is absolutely ridiculous. He's getting almost four to one on his money with with whatever hand that he has, and he's he's going to be so hard pressed to fold because of how much money is in the pot that he's almost forced to call here. Given even though he correctly he could probably correctly assume that I'm only doing this with the absolute nuts, but he's gone ahead and made the pot so big with whatever hand that he has multi-way that we are going to get tons more value. Now, we get some chat here. Rick, Ricky Boy said big pot before Wesley decides to call, and I'm, I'm, I really don't like it when other players put, or I'm sorry, when other players talk while my hand's all in. I don't know if it was all in at that point. I don't know if he's allowed to talk while my hands are all in, but that said, now there's $245 in the pot. The ace kind of worried me a little bit now that we're all in but you know if he rivers if he rivers a set of aces then it's just a good game but much to my surprise you'll see the hand that he actually does have I have sevens I have the nuts we we had pocket tens to put in 80 big blinds on the turn with an overcard comes with a guy in the side pot so that is mad value we got there he might have folded to our check raise on the flop he probably put us on a weaker pair once we just called the flop but he probably should have gotten away on the turn, no matter what his hand was in that scenario. Unless maybe it was 9-10. Because right now, the tough pocket 10s is probably the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th nuts in this scenario. You're not including all the hands that are queens are better, jacks are better. There, there are so many hands in this scenario that ten, pocket 10 should not be in here. And if you guys want to see what the donkey's hand was, pocket 4s. So yes, we got mad value from two opponents. By taking one street off on a very dry board, in a scenario where you have a, a complete lock on the hand, like I said, Dezanin was drawing dead, 
practically to her backdoor gut shot. And Wesner was drawing the two outs. And with a very little with very little risk to to getting a lot of value because we put our opponent on such a strong hand. So this is what this is a uh, how to play really a monster hand with kind of two opponents and out of position on a dry board. This is I don't know how common of a scenario this is, but out of playing sets out of position is actually a very unique aspect and I believe that you you kind of need to know how to get the stacks in the middle by the turn. You don't want to wait until the river in most of the case scenarios to actually get them in because of the fact that a lot of players are going to associate you having strength on three, three streets and they're going to go ahead and fold. So we're going to go on to the next hand and go from there. Second hand or second hand we have pocket tens. Our opponent will be in middle position and his name is Trippard and at this point in, in the game I have zero hands on him only because of the fact that this was my second hand at the table I just posted in the big blind and it's going to fold around to us in this scenario we have several options we could we're not going to fold I think our hand is just way too strong to fold in this case especially with pocket tens even though we're up against an unknown player, we're still getting it's three and a half dollars for us to call, and it's less than five percent of our stack. It's almost three percent of our stack, and according to the rule of of five and ten, is that you can cold call prefub for set value as long as it costs you less than five percent of your stack, but never more than ten. If you want me to, I have I explained this in a post on the grinding school forum somewhere, but if you would like to me to explain this some more, I will. Just go ahead and, and post a question and into into this thread and I will gladly do so. Our other option is we could re-raise. However, re-raising a middle position opponent with a marginal hand out of position is not a very good move, especially without a read. Especially also when we can just cold call preflop and have it be so much both easier to play post flop, and if, because if it's a really bad board, say three overcards and we completely miss, then we don't have to see better anything. And if it's an undercard board, we we can check fold and peel a flop and go from there. We could open lead if it's if we want to. There's many different ways we can play this hand. But none of them is to fold, and I really don't like re-raising here either. So that makes our only play is the call. And it's going to be heads up, and since the notion of this video is Valley Town, we flop our set. Now look how nasty of a board this is, not really to us, but what we can represent in this case. Since we flop the, the set, and we're only behind pocket jacks in this scenario, we're not going to lead it to, into our opponent, because we really want our opponent to at least put his seabed in. And if he has a hand like ace-king or ace-queen, there's a chance that he might call a check-raise, thinking that he has a lot of outs, either to the gut shot and the overcards, or whatnot. But either way, he's probably going to be seabedding this board a very wide range with a hand like ace-king, ace and maybe even if he has a heart or two hearts, I want him to go ahead and bet so I can check-raise and go and get it in from there. Now if he has an overpair, queens, kings, or aces, he's not going to give us very much credit because of how draw heavy this board is. Not only is there so many straight draws in this board, the queen king or the queen nine, nine, eight, very common straight hands, there's also the flush draw out there, and the two, well he he's really not making sense of it, I could also have a hand like ten jack, but if he has an overpair there, he's not really going to put that in my range because he's still going to stack off with it. So I go ahead and check to him. And he's a little bit short stacked, remember, too, so he's got about 90 big blinds, which does matter somewhat on the final bet, but not in this case scenario, because we're going to go ahead and let him bet two-thirds of the pot, and in this case, this scenario, a lot of times when you do check raise, your opponent does have something like nines or eights in this scenario, and he just goes ahead and folds. But there are those aren't those are the times when you get unlucky. When you get lucky, 
and our well, first off, what what is our play here? We can't call. There's just too many hands out there that either will that want to see the next card. Say he has a flush draw, or if he has two overs in the gut shot, all that case scenario, we want him to pay for whatever hand he has. So now it's time for us to put the pressure on ourselves, and we're just going to go ahead and a little check raise up to 18. 3x is bet. I'll, I'll do this here with a set. I'll do this here with two pair, uh, with a combo draw. With, with a, uh, it's a fairly wide range, but I really don't ever plan on doing this and then folding to an all-in. The fact of the matter is, if you check raise on someone on this board and you and you show, and I'm sorry, you fold to an all-in, you pretty much, and if you have showdown value, say if you have a hand like nines or eights here and you do this, it's not a very good play because you turn your hand into a bluff. He's going to fold at anything that you beat anyway. But he's only going to, when you, he's only going to call you with hands that beats you. So I'm, I'm selling strength here, but I'm also symbolizing the draw. And he goes ahead and shoves all in, and I really don't understand why. Well, I know why, but he, with a hand such as his, pocket kings, which is what he'll show over here in a minute. We'll go back. He has pocket kings. Given given my play, his shove on this flop is probably the worst play you can make with a hand like pocket kings. And the reason why I say that is because when he four bets me all in, I'm calling with a set, two pair better, and a combo draw. Um, my pair and flush draw, I'm open and straight flush draw, gut shot, straight flush draw. Maybe an ace high flush draw to go with a gut shot, straight flush draw with ace high. All of these hands absolutely crush Pocket King's equity on this flop. So therefore, he turns his own hand, Pocket King's here, into a bluff as I'm folding every single possible hand that he beats me on. However, I'm calling with 100% of the hands that is crushing him, only because his hand is so face up right now that I know he has an overpair. And that's what makes his shove so incorrect. What I would have done if I were him, so of shoving on such a draw board, and if you don't know if your opponent has a set or not, you can go ahead and flat, in this case scenario, and see what happens on the turn. The turn would have came a queen of hearts, and if I had a flush draw, guess guess what just got there? My flush just got there. Unless you and now, unless you have the king of hearts, you really need to go away. Especially if I go ahead and lead, because I'm never folding my tens. But now, all the hands that I could have that were beating, could hands that were behind the kings with the draws and whatnot, has just gotten there. The eight nine has got there. If I had a hand like queen jack, it just got there. Now pocket kings beats absolutely nothing in this case scenario, and the pot would have been forty eight. I'm sorry, thirty six plus. the pot pre-flop, which was 9, 36 plus 9, it would have been $45 on the, on the turn. And I would have led probably between 34 and to 45. And he probably would have had to just go ahead and fold. Unless he, unless he has a king of hearts. I don't know if he does. He doesn't. So therefore, he should be folding uh, the turn to my bet. Even though he does have an open and straight draw now, and, and it's a decent number of outs, but the fact of the matter is, against my hand range, his open and straight draw is no longer any good. Because I either have the flush in this case, or a set, and him getting 30, me betting 35 or so into the 48, or I'm sorry, whatever the pot was, 42, 30, 34 and 30, 42, he's just not getting the correct pot odds to call, even though he has an open and straight draw. He's only getting roughly a little over 2.5 to 1 to call on a 4 to 1 draw in this case scenario, and it's just not profitable. But, in that sense, I get a stack anyway with the kings. So, this is a case where flopping a set out of position, you can get some value by check-raising your opponent, hopefully your opponent will make a bad shove. And usually, when you're getting, when you get check-raised, shoving over the top with, a, with an overpair in this scenario, unless your opponent is a really bad player who's going to be check-raising with ace-jack and then stacking off to, off to a shove, and there are those players out there, and but uh, with I'm an unknown at this point, so doing this to an unknown is not a very plus EV move.
In this next hand, we again have a pocket pair. And we're going to go ahead and go and do this pretty quickly here. Our opponent isolates the on the gun limber. Let me go ahead and get some stats out here for you first. So the stats in our opponent. Stubble Beard is a pretty aggressive. Over around 20, 30 hands, I have him as another 36, 16 or so. And the under the gun limp, which we give no credit to usually in most in most cases, pretty weak, is a 57. Yeah, I'm sorry, 57, 7 over 42 hands. So he has a very, very wide range. And so, so we can we can also assume that Stubble Beard is going to be isolating this player with a pretty wide range. But that said, we're still going to get very good odds to call. We, it's three dollars to call, and we are going to already assume that Nickets is going to call as well because he's a 57-7. So with his three dollars in the pot as well, we're already getting three to one to call on our set. And even though in this scenario we have a little bit of a short stack because we didn't get the top off in time from the last hand, we are still getting over. I'm sorry, under five percent of our stack. So rough three percent, three dollars in the 76 is oh. Let's see, 5% would be 10%, 7.6, 5%, 3 .6. So it's just just under 5% of our stack. So it's definitely a, a, a good call. And since we run so well, make, we're making this video, we flop a set. Now, this case is a little bit different than the first case, because if you remember, the donkey was on our left, and the preflop razor was on our right. But now we have the exact opposite of that. We have the aggressor on our left and the donkey. I'm sorry, the donkey on our left, and it's all about the position. I'm sorry, we were in position. I I I I'm getting confused here. Okay, the donkey is is directly in between us and the original preflop razor, whereas before. The original preflop razor was directly on my left, and the donkey what acted after that original preflop razor. And so, therefore, if the donkey acts before the preflop razor is, this is the perfect time to go ahead and lead into the pot. And so, therefore, we can trap the donkey to go ahead and put seven of his dollars in too. And if Stubblebeard has a big hand, it's going to make him make a larger raise on this flop. Say here the pot the pot's already nineteen and a half. If Nickets calls the seven, it's gonna be twenty six. And Stubblebeard, if he does have an over pair, top pair, top kicker, he's going to have to raise probably thirty six dollars, thirty eight dollars to go ahead and get and which is roughly half of his stack, and he's pretty much pot committed himself by that point. So what I'm going to do is I lead seven dollars or so. I probably could have led a little bit more if I had a hand like Ace Ten here. I might actually like a lead to nine, make it a little larger. There's a good chance to take it down. If I had a hand like Pocket Jacks, I might do the same thing in this scenario. Because that way I'll get both value from the donkey and uh, force the stubble beetle to reveal how strong his hand is as well. But since we have the nuts here, we're going to go ahead and, and lead in. And our donkey go has folds, unfortunately. And our aggressive player makes a very, very weak raise. And I really don't want a scare card to come off on this on this turn. There's so many draws out there. Jack Queen, Jack Eight, Seven Eight, any heart. You know, even the Jack King, uh, King Queen, all these hands. You know, if a Jack hits, I don't really want it's going to be really hard for me to get value because a jack is a, is a really bad hand, so is a, is a card, so is an 8, so is any heart. And so in my opinion, the best play to make now is he's already showing that he's got a, a decent hand or a hand that he wants to at least take control of or get some value out of. And so now I'm going to play my hand much like a combo draw would. Say if I had jack, queen, a heart, to seven, eight of hearts here. I'm going to go ahead and probably just insta-shove over him and try and get the most hold equity. Now... Me being a short stack here, not 100 big blinds deep, is also quite effective in me being able to get the stacks in the middle at this point, because it's 20, it's 
27 less dollars that he has to call in order to see a showdown. And you throw that other $27 in there, or I guess roughly now it's it's the seven. It's like roughly it's like 23 more dollars given what was pre-flop. If you throw the 23 dollars in there, it's now since it's it's now he's getting like 1.8 to one to call on his money, which is roughly almost two to one. If you throw the other twenty-three dollars in there, it's it takes his pot odds way, way down. So plus it also helps that he's short stack too. And so if I shove a hundred here instead of seventy-three, it looks a lot look, looks a ton of a lot stronger. Whereas I might just do this with, or he might think I'm doing this with a very weak hand. But that said, he goes ahead and, lo and looks looks me up. I'm assuming he has an over pair. The ace. Again, I, I really don't like the ace coming, but I remember the the quad twos just in case he did have the he have the set of aces there. But no, what he had is he had an ace ten, which we can go through his hand here and see how he played it. I like his isolation raise. I might have made it to five anyway, just because Nick is probably going to call and fold the flop regardless. In this case scenario, his raise to 16 really didn't give him any information at all on the strength of my hand. His raise is so weak that I have and will 4-bet here with missed overcards. Maybe not in this exact scenario, but I'm much, given his weak raise, there's a chance that I'm going to be 3-betting him here very light. There's a, I mean, there's a chance. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. However, he makes if he makes it 22... Or 24, 3x my raise, seven more dollars. He'll still have 57 behind, and I'm less likely to go ahead and shove on him with a marginal hand because I think he's pot committed. And in that case, if he makes a 23, he can go ahead and fold. Now, that might not be the best play in his scenario. That might be a better play than what he did. But raising to 16. And then calling my all in with top right top picker is probably not a very good move because he's hoping that I have the flush draw only or a straight draw. If I have a combination straight and flush draw, I have his equity pretty well smoked anyway. And so he's going to get the rest of his money in behind. That said, if I were him with the ace 10 to, to leading the 7 here, if we were 100 big blinds deep, I'll probably go ahead and raise it 22 24 and probably have to fold to the all in. But since we're not 100 big blinds deep and we're roughly 75 big blinds deep, I would go ahead and cold call the $7 and the 12 and a half and see what happens on the turn. Roughly with my with my set of twos, I'm probably going to go ahead and well depending on the turn, I'll either check raise the turn with my set of twos if he does call, or I will lead big again trying to get trying to build a pot and get value from an overpair. Unfortunately for him, he would have turned the ace to give him two pair, and he would have stacked off regardless. So that's the end of that hand, and we're going to go on and go ahead into the next hand here. We have the Jack Queen of Hearts, and I'm going to get you some stats. Give me a second. Here, this the stats that I have on in these hands are not applicable because of the fact that this is my first hand at the table, and I'll go ahead and post the big blind. And I'm liking this table already because you can see that it is going to be, oh, I'm sorry, our opponent min-raises us pre-flop. And if you've seen my videos before, I really don't fold anything playable in the big blind to a min-raise because the odds are so great. However, jack-queen suited is even more of a case because I'm only getting, I'm getting something like a gazillion to one or roughly nine to one in this case. So just for the fact of matters, you have to call here and hope if you flop top two pair or flop the straight or flop even a really nice combo draw. And since this video is about value, we flop good and we flop top two pair. As you may notice from one of our earlier hands, we have the best position on the pre-flop razor. He has acted directly to our left. And so, therefore, we check, we give him the opportunity to bet and everybody else to act before we get to act. So therefore, leading into the pre-flop raise in this case, not a very good move because then if he does raise us and he has a, and he has aces or kings here, he goes ahead and raises out everybody else on the table who we want value from. 
And so our our best play here to, again is to check raise. Full we fully expect Rarf Tastic to, 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 to bet. And he only bets two dollars, and oh, it's better than him not betting at all. But we would have liked to have seen him bet a lot, like eight or ten dollars or so. But now that M Roscoe has come into effect, we have to put him on a range. Now in a limped pot, over limped. You can put his range on roughly the flush draw. Let's say an anti flush draw would raise here. He could have two pair, queen jack, same as me. He could have a set of twos, which we're not really a fan of, but that's the case with payoff. He could have nine ten, nine ten of spades, he could have king ten, he could have king queen, any of these number, any of these number hands, combo draws and whatnot. But if he does have a hand like Queen-10 suited or something like that, he doesn't have as much equity as he thinks he does. He only has the flush draw because we have top two pair. So even though there's a bet and a raise in front of us, we still have to check raise here. We don't want any more scarecrows to come off on that turn. We don't, we, if another opponent does have a hand like Queen-2 suited, you never know. You never know if he has Queen-2. These guys overlumped pot. These guys could have any two cards because that's what they play. We also don't want an overcard to come off, say, an ace, and it's going to be hard for us to get value from a worse queen. So it's time for us to check raise, and we're going to go ahead and check raise probably to 24, 22. We want him to call still with his flush draw and weak queens. And um, so, so we, we check raise, you know, we want to check raise to build the pot. But you also don't want to raise him out of the pot so that he'll call us only with his best hands. You want, we want him to call us with the hands that he's dominated by. So the pot is already $42. And the donkey gets out, who got who min raised preflop. And as soon as M. Roscoe just goes ahead and flat calls this flop, I'm pretty much guaranteed that I'm ahead. Like I'm 95 to 98% sure that I'm ahead on this spot. Our, so our opponent here either has like the flush draw. Or he has a queen jack as well, or maybe, you know, a weak two pair. But I'm also assuming that he's willing to stack off with his hand. Because of the fact is that he, not only did he bet the flop, he raised the flop and he called a, a, a sizable check, a check raise on the flop to go with it. So once you get in your mind that your opponent isn't folding, now it's just, now it's just time for you to get your opponent to put his chips in the middle with the the mar with the worst hand. Now I could sit here and lead thirty five or forty into fifty six half my stack and I but however I want him to come over the top of me right now. I I want him to think that he has fold equity. And so I can make a smaller bet here, knowing full well that he probably does have the flush draw. And I want him to call the turn on the flush draw. It's only because I, I want to build the pot because I'm so far ahead. Him in the flush draw here, he's only got 18% equity. He's got a 5 to 1 draw, and he's got to assume that he's gonna, I'm going to pay him off on the turn, or I'm sorry, on the river when he, or if he hits. And most likely, if I only bet half the pot here and a flush draw comes in, I'll probably just check fold. Because if the flush draw comes in on the river and I check and he shoves, He's not usually doing that as a bluff, as much as much as he is with the with the made hand. And I now since the turn boats me up and I have the absolute nuts, I no longer have to worry about the flush draw as well. On top of that, I now even more want him to call me with the flush draw, and so I'm going to going I'm going to give him really really good odds. I want him to be able to pay for his 9-10 or his king-10 or his flush draw here. I want him to think that he has either one good enough implied odds or two, uh, he thinks that he has fold equity if he were to go all in on me. So I make a pretty weak bet, $25. I want him to, I want him to call me and I also want to be able to build the pot. Like, I don't want to check here and have him check behind and have, the, have it come in on the river and then it's going to be a lot harder for me to build a pot. Where if I just bet 25 here and he puts another 25 in the pot, he's getting like 3.2 to 1. He's going to be really hard pressed to fold a flush draw in this case because because he's got 
not only does he have 3.2, but he's also got another 2x behind him. So he's got 5 to 1 implied odds, making, if I did have a hand like aces here, that he could call me profitably with just the bare flush. So I want to go ahead and make sure that I give him odds to call. And to my surprise, he goes ahead and shoves in. And I'm probably thinking that he has queen jack and we're splitting it. If he has pocket, I don't think he has pocket queens or ever. So at worst, I'm splitting here. And, you know, I, I cash in. And what does he have? He has the mighty queen five of spades. Very nice, sir. You had zero equity when you got your money in. I guess you could have hit a random queen or a, a no, not even a jack, a random queen. So if I if I had his hand besides folding preflop, I like the flop raise of the raw tastic, but to my check raise, I guess you probably still have to call as well, although I'm really not liking it. Fourteen, he's getting three to one to call on his flush draw. Yeah, I think he's got to call on the flush draw. However, once the turn pairs, you pretty much got to give up and let it go. Although it's really tough to fold the flush draw in this case, the fact that I'm giving you such good odds. But once the board pairs, you have to seriously discount the likelihood if you do hit your flush that you're going to be actually be ahead. So this is us flopping top two pair in a limp pot. And I should have, I'm going to go ahead and go on to here to the next hand. And in this case, we're going to go ahead and flop bottom two pair in another limped pot. I love six-way limped pot, especially when there's only seven players at the table. And again, we aren't going to lead here. And the reason why I don't like a lead in, these case, in this case is because it doesn't build the pot fast enough. If we were to bet, f bet pot, pot, pot on flop, turn, and river, the chances are we're not going to be able to get it in if we're 100 big blinds deep by that time. Whereas if we check raise, our pot is so much larger, as I will go through here in a minute. So we check in this flop, hope planning the check raise, just about everybody. Okay. Plus, everybody's so short stacked that it doesn't really matter. Like these, all these guys here, we're going to go with this guy here. If we check raise and bliss bass four bets us all in, we might rethink about our hand. But till then, luckily their opponent to our left goes has and bets two thirds, and we're going to raise him. We want to build the pot. I don't know if I raise a twelve or sixteen here. I bet the fifteen, which is it's a sizable raise. It's almost four times his raise. To a good player, you would think that I mean business and I have a strong hand, but. To a donkey who's just going to stack off to me regardless, I want to build the pot. Because look what happens when he calls here. The pot is $36, and he's only got $48 behind. If I were to only lead, say if I were to lead 4 or $5 here, the pot's going to be 11 He's going to call me. It's going to be $16 if I lead and he calls. The debt difference in pot between 16 and 36 is over two times that amount of money. That's going to escalate even more because of the fact that I can put. He's only got roughly, depending on what the turn card brings, he's got really no implied odds behind him. So I can go ahead and bet so much that he has to call me on the turn if he does have a draw, and it's going to be totally incorrect for him to do so with zero implied odds. So in this case, the pot's $36. I'm probably going to go ahead and bet 25 ish. Twenty-six dollars or so, which is this, which is over half of his stack. And in this case scenario, I'm already committed to having to go all in with him. If he has a hand like eight-six or the five-seven, then I I have to pay him off, and that's cooler. But he can't really call me here with a flush draw. He's getting two point four to one with less than one x implied back. So if he does have a bare flush draw, he's only got like three point whatever he has at a one and. So I'm just looking, trying to just chip away at his at his half stack here. I I could probably bet closer to thirty and leave him eighteen dollars behind, but I like giving him like twenty two dollars behind here because I, it gives him an impression that he has one money behind. He might he might have some implied odds, which he really doesn't. So he goes as and called us anyway. And this point, like I said, the pot is eighty eight dollars. We started the pot on a flop of with thirty six as compared to sixteen. 
Now, if I had bet, if the pot, if this pot was 16, I would have had to let 12. He would have called 12. 20, 12 plus 12 plus 16 is 40 dollars. So again, instead of the pot being 88 dollars, the pot would have been 40 dollars. Again, under half the pot would have been normally had I not check raised. And in this case scenario, by the way, guys, he's only got $22 left behind. The pot's closely almost 90 bucks. It doesn't matter what t what the river comes. You guys got to go with it. You got to stick it in. You're going to get five to one on your money. And unfortunately for us, it was the queen of diamonds that came in. And at this point, you really hate your hand. But there's only one way to play it. You can't check because he checks behind a really wide range of hands that you do beat. Say he decided to call you with an eight for some reason. He's going to call your all in here with a much wider range than he's going to bet himself. And for value. And so you want to just go ahead and stick it in. He's going to call you with a wider range. You know, just put them all in. Yeah, you feel bad. It sucks he hit his draw. Oh, wait. Oh, look at that. He only had a king eight of hearts. Yeah, he didn't hit the diamond draw, did he? No, you got him to put in 65 big blinds with only a weak top pair hand on the flop and a backdoor draw. So that is how we build the pot in that case against a, a donkey and we're out of position from the blinds on limped pot. Which is actually a very common scenario. Building pots like this and getting stacks from in limped pots is very key. And, and betting pot, pot, pot in this scenario is not going to be the best way for you to get money. Our next hand here is not going to be very complicated at all. We're going to have aces. And yeah, we have aces, but sometimes you have to get value from aces too. And Preflop here, cold calling is bad, and we got to raise it up here to at least 10, maybe even 12, so we can build the pot in a raised pot. Yeah, make it 10. I, I like it 12 more than 10 in this case, but what are you going to do? And we get limp re-raised. And you have a hand like aces, and it'll happen every once in a while, maybe not every session, but every other session where you're, where you're the one who gets re-raised, or 4-bet, and you have aces, and you really don't know what you should do here. Like, should I should I go ahead and call and play post flop with him, or or what should I do? Should I four bet all in? You know, but in this case, the scenario you have to pretty much put him on a range. And what is he limp min re raising me with? So not only is he min re raising me or, or close to it, he's making it just one above it, but he's doing it limp style. And usually it's a very strong hand when somebody does it. Usually like a large pocket pair or whatnot. And it usually means that he wants to, to go with a hand. So in this case scenario, this is a perfect time to go ahead and just put all your chips in the middle with aces preflop. And just shove. And he had pocket kings and we go ahead and hold. Whereas there's a chance that if we just go ahead and cold call that on um, preflop, either an ace will hit, an ace will hit or maybe even a queen, maybe he's scared of us he's scared of us having pocket queens in this scenario. And he's not gonna stack off to us as much as he would preflop with his hand like pocket kings. The goal with aces a lot of times is to get most of your money in ahead on the on the either preflop or on the flop. And if your opponent has shown so much strength to you that he's limp re raised you and you have pocket aces or even pocket kings, just go ahead and get your chips in the middle preflop and save yourself the, the hassle of trying to outplay your opponent out, out of position post flop especially in a, in a re-raised pot. So I'm going to go on go on to the next hand. We have ace-queen. And let me go ahead and get stats again for you guys. Okay. What we're, I'm going to go ahead and show you is what happens your pre-flop. On, on early, a middle position player limps, and we're going to make our standard 5x raise here with the ace-queen, 4x plus 1. And you pay for college, goes as in cold call us, and I've got a pretty wide range on him, pretty pretty large sample. During this time, this was probably one of my first few sessions playing 100 and out on Poker Stars, and I was paying attention to what kind of hands he was playing, and I'm fairly certain that he is a fairly aggressive player, at least post-slop, or and he's, and he's a tricky player because of the fact that he I have seen him squeeze so far uh, say on like early position razor a couple a few cold callers and he's going ahead and squeezed and folded to a four bet all in 
And when you see somebody re, uh, three bet large preflop and unfold to a large four bet, you can probably assume that they're doing it somewhat lightly, and in in even more so when there's a lot of cold callers in the pot. So in that regards, when he cold calls me here, I pretty much put him on exactly a pocket pair. And the reason why I say that is because he's fairly standard, even though I have him as a pretty tight stats, uh, roughly 11-9. He's cold calling me only with pocket pairs and maybe king-queen. But he's going to be re-raising me with ace-king, probably even ace-jack in this scenario, probably with hands, tens or better. So we're looking at him roughly having pocket pair, nines or worse. He might have ace-ten. Uh, I don't know but why he would cold call with ace-10 in this scenario. And so we're going to go ahead and we have, we fought middle pair top kicker on this board. And the fact of the matter is, how do you want to play against this guy? Like, if we go ahead and bet here, we had, we fold everything that we beat. Meanwhile, we give him opportunity to cold call us in position and float us. And so we're going to have to fire two barrels in this case with a hand that we're not really going to like too much against someone's against his calling range. So out of position here, we're pretty much betting to take down the pot. And this, and actually against most players, if he was a little bit needier and I didn't have a read on him that he was going to be aggressive and he's going to try and squeeze and try and outplay people post-flop, I think in this case he's already 3 bet me a couple times to pre-flop, so he's, he's definitely kind of trying to get out of line. However, if I bet and he raises me, it's and he could do that with a very wide range, it's very, very hard for me to continue with my hand. And so the best case scenario, in my opinion, is here, I'm going to go ahead and just check to him. I'm not really worried about the flush draw. What could he possibly have that he cold call me preflop other than maybe ace-jack suited, ace-10 suited, that he has a flush draw, and if the flush draw hits, then and if he bets, then I might let it go. But I go ahead here and check out a position against their opponent. Now, I want to make this clear really quick. This is a very high variance play. When you don't know if your opponent has either the nuts or a bluff, it becomes a very high variance scenario, especially when you give him the opportunity to bluff at you. So, don't your stomach's make a little bit squirmish on those hands, guys, but this is how I get value from an aggressive player. So, uh, sometimes. A lot of times I might just try and play it more standard. He goes ahead in here and leads 9. Now, that's a pretty large bet in this case. So he leads 9 in the 12, 3 quarter size pot. And like I said before, he might call me with king-queen. He might call me with a large ace. But for the most part, or he might even have king-jack suited here, but for the most part, I really don't think he has a king. Which is the reason why I checked to him to begin with. If I thought he had a king, I might go ahead and lead and or if a king maybe would be in his range more, a bet might make more sense. Because, well, I don't, I don't know if a bet would make more sense if I think he has a king. But but given the fact that he, he usually has a bluff here, or he has a very wide range, he's going to try and take the pot away from me, then I have to go here and let him check, and let him bet it. He could also have a set of threes, but that's only like one card, and one set possible set that he could have, so I'm not too worried about it. Now, the turn is what really makes this hand interesting. Because not only does the turn pair the king, but he gives another draw out there, too, just in case he had another he had another over cards and whatnot, to go, uh, if he had another suit to go with. The reason why I say the king is interesting, because of the fact that, s that it really takes away the number of combinations of kings that he could have in his hand. There's only two kings left out there in the deck, and given the fact that there's two kings on that board. Given his cold calling range, the number of the chances that he has a king in his hand is actually very, very small. And so what are my options here in this case? I could bet bet large, twenty to twenty five dollars, thirty to thirty dollar pot, and hope he doesn't raise me and if he does I have to fold. But why would I bet twenty, twenty five dollars here? Because then I just turn my hand into a bluff and I get him to fold everything that I beat again. He might you never know, he might actually two-barrel me here with, with with whatever hand he has, because the hands that I'm most likely playing like this in this scenario is either the nuts, like kings or queens, or a marginal hand, like jacks or tens, that I'm not really looking... I'm looking to get him to bluff me in two streets to check behind the river on. 
However, if I were to check and check call this turn, I have to go ahead and check call a blank river. I, I can't check call this turn here and check fold the river to him because that's just us spewing. If you're going to check fold the river to him when then the draw misses, then you have to go ahead and check fold this turn. If you're not willing to go with your hand right now when you check call this turn, then you shouldn't be going with it. Especially if you have it and your opponent is aggressive and you give him the opportunity to bluff, I've said this before, you have to go ahead and make sure you call him. You don't want to you don't want to give him the opportunity to bluff you out of a pot, to bluff at you in a pot where you have a decent amount of equity on and you have no opportunity to win it. And you're just check calling, check calling, only to check fold later. That's not a very plus EV way to play. So I go ahead and check here again. And he makes a not as large of a bet as he did on the on the flop. He bet 21 30 2 thirds pot. In this case scenario, I know what hand I'm representing. And I'm representing jacks or maybe even ace queen. And for the most part, if I did have jacks here, I probably would let it go. However, this is one of those I'm leveling him in this spot because I know that he knows that I have that he's putting me on jacks and a weak hand I'm going to call. And so therefore I'm getting him an opportunity to go ahead and try and bluff me out of the pot. But like I said earlier, as soon as I make this call, I have to decide and what I've already decided whether or not I'm what rivers I'm stacking off on. And those rivers are blank rivers, so no clubs. Uh, the diamond draw would be really sick if you run or diamond me, but that would be a scenario. But if the clubs come in, I probably would let it go. However, the river is a complete blank, four of spades. Like you couldn't get any bigger of a brick than that. And so now our pot is monstrous on us, and there's only really one option to go. And that's to check again, and hopefully that he checks behind, right? You know, we don't want him to go ahead and shove on us. But, oh man, this is so hard. I mean, how do you guys deal with this? Like like we said on the turn, though, we pretty much got to go with our hand. I mean, what's it? What, it's one buy-in, okay? How many times have we guys, how many times have we dropped a buy-in on a hand where we played bad or, you know, we get cooler or whatnot? I mean, I've lost, you know, you're going to lose over the course of a session several buy-ins probably if you play a couple thousand hands. Over the course of a week, you're going to get stacked. And the fact of the matter is, if you aren't willing to go ahead and put the chips in when you think you're this far or when you're ahead and you put you got your opponent to go ahead and bluff, then you probably shouldn't be playing. Or otherwise you shouldn't be making these risky plays, these high variance plays. So we go through his hands here again. What hands are he is he shoving me here on the river? He's probably he's shoving me the nuts, probably the king queen, the king jack, the ace king, the pocket threes, the pocket fours. He's also shoving the absolute bluff. These whatever hand that he has, he's turning it into a bluff here. Uh, he, either he has a pocket pair between fives and jacks, and he's turning into a bluff, or he could have a missed flush draw in this case. He could have a missed ten jack, an open and straight draw. He has, he could have a very much wide, very wide missed range of hands. But since I really have him on having a complete having the nuts, which is trips are better, or boat, or having a bluff. I actually have a pretty decent bluff catcher here with second pair, or which is actually rather two pair top top kicker. In fact, if he had a hand like queen jack, he's probably going to check behind queen jack or queen ten on this river. So he's not really going to be making this play with a queen because of the fact he probably already thinks he's ahead. He probably wouldn't even bet the turn with a queen because he probably thinks he's going to be so far ahead and he'll bluff catch my bet on the river. So this is all about knowing your opponent, and I know my opponent's aggressive, and so. I make the crying call, and lo and behold, he has pocket sevens, which is nothing. Yeah, he had, he turned his pocket sevens, which actually has a decent amount of showdown value, into a bluff. Now, the fact of the matter is, if he was already ahead, he wasn't, it wasn't really going to matter too much. He, like, on the flop, I could understand a bet if I had a hand like, I might like check full jacks, or eight, but I probably would see bet most of my other hands, to tell you the truth. 
if I had a hand like 10-9 or along those lines, and I'm going to go ahead and check fold the flop anyway, so his bet is just to take down the pot. And But once I call the call the flop at his hand with the pocket sevens, he's either going to be way ahead or going to be way behind. So he, now he's just trying to bluff me out of the pot. So I go ahead and make a really sick river call. And I'm surprised myself that I was actually right. But I gave him the opportunity to bluff, and I take the pot down. And so I'm rewarded in making a a really, really tough call. And I'm aware that it's a tough call, and I don't expect a lot of players to make that same tough call. However, it is a call sometimes that you have to make. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video now. I think it's gotten pretty large. Oh, you know what? Okay, there's one hand to go. I know it's getting pretty late in this video, but I do only have one. No, I guess I have a couple more hands. Oh, we're going to go ahead and go through these really quick. Because I don't want to make, I don't have enough hands to really make another video. But late, late position raise, we're going to be raising Ace King here against Schwartz Tech 100% of the time. This is just going to show you that when you flop top of Tech Picker uh, with in a re-raised pot, just go ahead, don't slow play it out of position. Go ahead and put your money in. Since he's Schwartz Tech, you don't have to see but too much. You kind of want him to think he has fold equity. Maybe he might stack off with Kings or a flush draw here. And I go ahead and stick the rest of it in, and he shows. 10 8. I don't know why. Who knows? But I got value town from him. Okay, the next hand, we're going to go pretty quick. King Queen. Very standard for me to isolate this player on the open limper. And this is going to be uh, uh, the end of our video, but it's actually going to be something to think about that you guys want, that you guys probably want to think about in the future. And that is when you have top air top kicker in position, what's the best way to get value from it? If we bet here, we're representing the exact hand that we have. In that case, we're representing top pair. Or we could be still betting, and he might call us one street with, you know, a middle pair. He might call us with a weak queen. But the fact of the matter is, he probably won't call us two streets. And this board is so dry that he either that we already have him completely crushed, or he or we're either way ahead, I'm sorry, or way behind. And the only really scare card coming on the turn is a king. Or, I'm sorry, is an ace to come. Otherwise, we we are pretty much pretty far ahead. If he has queen jack or queen ten and a jack or ten comes, maybe it's a little bit different story. But that said, I really don't think it's really tough for me to put him in that range. His his limp call. He most likely has a pocket pair in his hand. And so my best play in this case scenario is just to go ahead and turn or check behind the flaw. I've done this before in MTT videos, is because you're going to get value from a lot wider range. And now that this board pair of threes, that just takes a number of sets out of his hand. So now you only have like pocket fours, or have him completely dominated. The only problem is that now that the clubs have come in, I kind of want to go ahead and bet protect my hand. I'll get some value from another club coming out. So he checks. And I bet it's kind of weak. It's like seven and eleven and a half. But I guess I'm trying to get a little bit of value in this case. So. Hopefully, you know, he's going to call me with a pretty wide range here. And the trick is now what to do on the river. Now that this river is complete blank, I don't know what he could have that he, that he would beat us at this point. We, we outkick him on any queen other than ace queen. He either has the boat or he doesn't. And so we're going to go ahead, and when he, if he checks to us here, we're going to go ahead and, and lead. And so he does check to us. And we're going to go ahead and put another little value bet out there, either 15, 16 ish. Yeah, 15 is a good bet. Because as soon as we flop, check behind the flop, we've already symbolized that we have a pretty weak hand. And the fact of the matter is, we're probably not going to be ba making this bet with a hand like pocket jacks or pocket tens. So we either have the, a monster here, or we're making a, or we have a queen, and since we check behind the flop, why would we have a queen in this case? So we're going to get a call pretty lightly from either hand like pocket jacks, you know, sixes, sevens, thinking that we're trying to put two barrel bluff on him. And so when he does call us, and we're going to be ahead, guess what can he call us with? Exactly what we thought he was going to do. He called two barrels for, with pocket nines. So by checking behind that flop, we got an extra two streets of value from him, or probably one street of value. We would have gotten him to call the flop bet, most likely. But getting him to call another bet on the Turner River is going to be very hard if we don't check behind that flop. Or even check behind the turn. We're going to have to check behind one of the two streets. And I'll check behind the flop in this case, because it because we're checking behind the flop here also in hands that we miss a lot of the times. So it's kind of both balances out that range. 
So hopefully this video has been very informative for you guys. If you guys have any other questions, go ahead and contact me by PM or put them in the forum. But otherwise, this has been Code Red Rules for GrindSchool.com. Go look at the tables.